All right, we are back with another Growth Lab training session, and we are joined again by our marketing experts, Jack and Jen. Um, welcome back to the Growth Lab. Uh, how have you guys been? Very good. Great. Awesome. Well, um, so in today's session, we're going to be focusing on advanced Facebook ads. Uh, what could we expect to learn in today's session? Yeah, sure. So we're going to try and do a few things in today's session. Um, one is how to test and create dark posts for your ad account. So dark posts has been one of the most important scaling techniques that we've used um, at our agency. We've spent millions of dollars on just a handful of ads because you've really got to focus on your best possible ads. So I'm going to show you the process we use for uh, testing creative and copy, turning that into a dark post, and then how to use that dark post to not only vertically scale your spend, but also horizontally scale that same ad post across multiple uh, interests and targeting options and that sort of thing. And then we're also gonna do, uh, like we did with our similar sessions, I think we're going to hang around at the end and do some live reviews. So if you wanna get your uh, landing pages or ads ready, um, we'll go through at the end and we'll do some live reviews on how we would, we would suggest improving them or how we suggest uh, you know, marketing your business and what type of Facebook ads you should be running. So have that queued up and ready for the end section um, because I think uh, we'll, we'll do that after we've done all the, all the teaching and the training. That sounds awesome. All right, everyone, stick around for the end so you can get Jack and Jen to review your uh, sites. And otherwise, sharpen your pencils and buckle up uh, and enjoy the class. I will hop into the control room, but if you need me, just call me I'll, and I'll come right back. We'll Take do. it away. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen here. Um, give me one second while I open this up. Okay, now let me know if you can see that and if it's big enough. Um, we're going to try and put it in presentation mode. Um, okay, so starting out, um, you know, if you haven't joined any of our previous sessions, um, you know, the reason that we're running these is because we've spent, you know, over $150 million across Facebook and Google in the last five to 10 years. Um, so we work with a lot of clients, e-commerce stores, and we really focus on helping them scale through paid channels. Um, we've worked on small accounts from $100 a day all the way up to $100,000 a day. And so a lot of these learnings that I'm teaching you are things that we've actually done and ways that we've actually grown and scaled e-commerce companies, um, a lot of them being Shopify. So uh, just to recap quickly what we're going to go over, I'm going to have a small introduction section about uh, one of the most important fundamental things when it comes to marketing. Uh, we see this all too often that stores are trying to jump the gun and they just want to get up their Facebook ads as fast as possible. But the actual fact is that before you start running your Facebook ads, you really want to understand a few core fundamentals about marketing. So it's like understanding your customer and then understanding the funnel and the temperature of that customer as they go through that funnel. So we're going to quickly talk about that because um, that is by far way more important than setting up or any ad hack or anything that you're going to learn in any webinar. And then we're also going to go over a few things about uh, the different types of things you can test and the different types of things we test uh, when we're running accounts and how you could go about that in turning that into a test campaign then a dark post. And then, as I mentioned, the horizontal and vertically scaling. I can explain a little bit more about what that exactly is. Um, but then we can also go through the live landing landing page reviews as well as um, ad reviews. Now, if you want us to review your ad, just make sure you get your ad post URL and chuck that in the chat at the end. And then for your landing page, that can also be your home page, just whichever page you're sending your ad traffic to. So starting out, um, let's jump into one of the core fundamentals here of uh, what I say is marketing in a nutshell. So. Really, when we're running ads, we're constantly looking at these three things um, because these three things we have control over and these three things are levers that we can pull to help improve our, our ROAS, which is a return on ad spend. Now, when we're looking at the success of an account, we're really looking at how much are we spending at what ROAS. Now, a lot of the questions we get is, okay, well, how do you, what's your target ROAS or how much should I spend? 
Now, a good rule of thumb is that we try and stay within the two and the four ROAS range. So the reason I say this is because if you are below a two ROAS, you shouldn't be scaling, you should be optimizing. If you're above a four ROAS, you should be scaling um, because it's very hard to do both at the same time. And you'll find that growth on any paid channel is very much like a staircase. So you have your optimization period uh, and then you have your scaling period. And so that is constantly helping each one of those things increase week after week. So your goal is to increase your spend and your ROAS, but you'll find that it works kind of like counterintuitively with each other. So first off, um, the first corner we look at when we're uh, looking at ways to grow our, uh, our spend and our ROAS is copy and creative. So this is something that you can always be testing. You can be testing different creative, different ad types, different copy. I usually suggest testing two to three um, copy options and then two to three creative options. Now creative does have a bigger impact. So if you don't have a huge budget, just start off with testing creative um, because this is really important for improving your click-through rates and getting people to engage with your ads. If people are not engaging with your ads and they're not clicking through to your site, no matter how much money you spend on Facebook, you're not gonna get the results that you're looking for because you need to be grabbing that person's attention. And a lot of the time that attention or that scroll stop is to do with the copy and the creative. Once uh, you have that sorted, then you're gonna start looking at your targeting and traffic. So where are you getting your traffic from? So this is gonna be focused on Facebook ads, but just in general as your own business, where are you getting your traffic from? What is the different quality of that traffic? What traffic can you control and what for example, pay for and what traffic are you getting organically? Now, organically, uh, the conversion rates and that traffic is gonna be very high quality because people are usually finding you through search and Google's usually pretty good at indexing you where you're supposed to be. So when you're looking at your uh, paid traffic, compare it to your organic traffic and see how you're doing. The idea is to continually be testing the targeting and the, uh, and the areas that you're getting traffic from so that you can continually improve that again to increase that ROAS or increase that scale. Now, what you see with uh, testing out different targeting is that's horizontal scaling because you're adding on more targeting options instead of just increasing spend. Now, this is really important because on Facebook, you can only vertically scale 10 to 20%, usually a day. We really suggest every few days to avoid that learning period. So if you can't scale quickly with spend, you have to scale horizontally. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind when you're thinking about this uh, process that we're gonna go through today about creating your ads and then uh, multiplying those into new targeting options. And the last corner that you're gonna have the lever on for improving your ROAS, improving the growth is your user experience. Now this session isn't so much focused on user experience on your website, but you know a few basic things that you can think about is, okay, when someone sees my ad, which landing pages am I sending them to? Or um, you know, does my landing page react well on mobile? Is my value proposition above the fold of my website? Are my call to actions really clear? Are the benefits and features of my product clearly being shown? So there's a bunch of ways that you can also improve the, the user experience. So copy and creative, you're gonna be focusing on cost per click, click through rate, targeting and traffic, you're gonna be looking at bounce rate on your website and conversion rates. And then user experience, you're definitely gonna be focusing on uh, conversion rate and ROAS. So those are three things that you should definitely focus on when you're like, okay, how can I improve my business? How can I grow and improve it? Um, now that kind of feeds into the funnel. So the funnel is something that you can look at in terms of your user's customer journey, user or customer journey, depending on what sort of product you sell. But essentially up the very top of the funnel, you have uh, all of your cold traffic. So that's the people who have no idea who you are. These guys are down here. Um, and so what you wanna do is you wanna find a way to capture that person's attention and to start caring about what you have to say. So usually you do this in a range of ways. You tell, you, you provide value, you entertain them, you make them laugh, but essentially at top of the funnel, you're not going for a direct sales pitch. So Facebook and Instagram is very much an interruptive marketing tactic. There's not people searching for your product like they are when they go and search in Google. So when you're interrupting someone, you need to provide value 
and make sure that they are getting something out of it before you can start asking them to buy something. So you can see here the different types of marketing messages and the different uh, uh, warmthness of that traffic. So cold is top of the funnel, hot is bottom of the funnel. So as you move through this, you change your marketing messaging. So up the top, you start with providing value, you create stories or share industry secrets or run something that's gonna give value, like lead baits, giveaways, all that sort of stuff. As they move down, you can educate them more on what your product is, what it does, the results. Um, and then once they get into this hot range, this is pretty much your remarketing. So this is when they know everything about your company and you're really looking to convert them at that point. You're, that you've invested uh, your time into giving them a lot of value and now it's time for them to return that favor and make purchases. So think about your funnel as well. So those two things are really important. Um, now we're gonna jump into how we go about creating these ad tests. Now, this is something that we've been doing for years and it continues to work, but we're gonna do this in a live account so you can kind of see the process, but there's multiple ways to create an ad test. So the old school way is to create multiple ads under one ad set and run all of those ads at the same time. And then you can choose which one is the best over that time period. Now I'm gonna show you this in a live view um, and then also talk about the other option, which the other option is using the new dynamic feature option. So that's when you load up a bunch of creative and copy into one ad campaign and then go from there. Now the secret to running these campaigns, let me just make this as big as possible. So you can see here, this is the test. We've got uh, prospecting, KTLA TV, and this is for a company called Micro Puzzles. And so what these guys do is they sell little puzzles online, direct to consumer. They have pre-made designs or uh, customized designs. Now, what we're doing here is last time we did a session, we set up this, um, we set up this test campaign and we let it run for, I think it was two weeks since we did the last training session or something. And so what we did was we used the old school way of creating an ad each. So you can see each one of these is an ad. So when you're creating your ad, if you don't know already, you're essentially choosing your ad type, you're choosing your creative, your copy, and you're putting together the ad. So you can see this is one variation and every ad is a separate variation. You can see here we've got KTLA TV interview, uh, one, two, and three. So each one of these is a different variation and we're running all of these. And I wanna point out one thing. So here with all of these ads, you can see they're all individual and they all collect their own social engagements here. So likes, comments, and shares. You can see this one has 43, 17, five. This one has 26 and three shares. This one has uh, eight, two and two. Now, this is really important because social media relies heavily on social proof and credibility. So when you're scrolling through your feed, if you keep seeing ads with no engagement on it, you're very likely to keep scrolling. If you see an ad with a ton of comments on it, a bunch of shares and likes, you usually take note and you're like, I wonder what this product is, or I wonder what this company is. Why is everybody so engaged in this? So this social validation is really important. And what you wanna do is you wanna keep that social validation as you scale this throughout your entire account. Because usually when you duplicate campaigns, you're gonna lose this social validation. Now, Facebook has added a feature where it's supposed to transfer it over, but we find it doesn't work 100% of the time. So we still use this dark post method. And you also can't transfer the social proof between campaign types. So if you're changing from an engagement campaign to a traffic campaign or a traffic campaign to a conversion campaign, you usually can't transfer this social engagement. So this is definitely a pain point because this is very important because as we look at our results here, this did spend the most just because it did optimize. Facebook will auto optimize your ads for you. But you can see here that this had by far the best ROAS, um, had the best cost per, uh, cost per purchase. Um, it had the best cost per add to cart. Um, I look at unique and totals because you can see here the difference between unique and totals in carts is very big. Um, had the best cost per click, had the highest click through rate. So this is clearly our winner. Now, the importance of running a test here is 
we don't know which one of these is going to win when we start out the campaign. So if you, for example, just created one camp, if you just created one ad and you didn't test these three, you might've created this ad and you would be paying four times as much for a customer. So this is really important to test this stuff and let Facebook find what the best one is and then scale that. So just going back here, um, I wanna go through the slides as well. Um, let us know and we can give you the slides too, just as a reference when you need to go back through this. I just wanna cover this um, dynamic option before I move on to actually creating the dark post and scaling it. So the dynamic option works like this. Um, you have multiple text options, you have multiple headlines and multiple descriptions. So you can see here, each one of these only has one. And we set up an example for the dynamic test. The dynamic test is only gonna have one ad in there, but it's gonna be dynamic. Dynamic meaning it's gonna populate all our different variations um, automatically and it should optimize it. So you can see here, we can test a bunch of images, we can test a bunch of copy and a bunch of headlines. Now, this one's a little bit harder because when you go to scale this, you have to make a new ad um, because you can't turn a dynamic ad into a dark post. What you can do is you can look at your dynamic split test. So you can easily see which image did the best, which copy did the best, which title did the best, and then you make your kind of master ad from that combination. Hey, Jack. Um, we have a couple questions, if you don't mind yep. just going back through a couple Absolutely. things real quick. Um, someone wants to know what's the difference between the three ads that you showed, um, just to see you know, the difference between um, all three and you know, what makes a CTR Yeah, so a few things here. That. So what you wanna test is you wanna test some images, you wanna test some videos. So you can see here, this one's an image, these two are videos. You also wanna test short and long form copy. So this is some longer form copy. You can see it's getting cut off. Um, if we look at the uh, news feed, you can see all the different options, but essentially this is getting cut off. And I'm pretty sure we tested a short form. Maybe this one. Okay, no, so we didn't test the text, we just tested the titles. So here we have fun micro puzzles to cure quarantine boredom. So we're looking at quarantine here, we were going a bit more general, fun micro puzzles. And here we were doing the yeah, fun micro puzzles for boredom. So essentially you just wanna test a few different things here. But the main things are you wanna test different creative. We didn't have too many creative because this was a uh, PR release that they got featured in this company. And we wanted to try and leverage uh, this and target people in Los Angeles because this is a Los Angeles based news channel and uh, these guys got featured. So we did the image ad and then we did the video ad. So the image ad actually did better in this scenario um, because you can see this is the full video, um, which is three minutes 50, but the video is still great. We might go back and do another test just with video to see if we can find a video option to scale. But in this example of this case study, uh, we definitely got better results with the image. Now, Oh, I can't hear you, Jen. Mike, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, sorry. Um, also, just to ask, a lot of people are asking too, how long are you testing these for and what would you recommend um, testing? Yep, so we, we tested this for two weeks. Um, so it was a total spend of $350, but you definitely don't have to test that much. Usually a good rule of thumb is to look at your accounts average um, or we'll look at your average order value and test two to three times that average order value. So for example, if you sell something that is $20, you might wanna test for 20 to $60. And remember, the more variations you have, the more money you have to spend on the test because you wanna make sure that it's not just like some lucky conversions. You wanna have adequate proof that this one is a clear winner. Um, so that's what I usually go, just as a general rule of thumb for testing. And the longer you test something, usually the more accurate the results will be. But you can see that this is by far, you probably could call this test a week ago um, because this one definitely won quite easily. So we definitely probably could have called this test last week, but we just ran it the whole time. And so that's for the length and the spend. Uh, in terms of what you wanna test, uh, definitely test image, versus video 
and different images and video, that's gonna be your biggest impact uh, variation change. And then you wanna test the title, that will be the second biggest, and then the, the text, uh, the, the description essentially. Um, so you wanna test those three things really. Um, you can get really nitty gritty and start testing a bunch of stuff like click through, uh, click through buttons, ad types, all that sort of thing. You can get uh, that granular, but if you're just getting started, just start with testing creative. And then as you do more of these, start testing more different, uh, more things. And you can see that you can do a lot more high intensity testing with the dynamic ads because you can test a ton of different variations. So in the dynamic test, you can see that here we have two images and these two images are gonna be multivariant tested with all of these options here. So all of these different uh, text options are going to be split test with all of each other. So you're gonna end up with like, you know, whatever it is, 32, 32 plus ads that are getting tested. Sorry, Jack, are you using the same audience on all three? Yeah, you wanna use the same audience because you wanna have everything under the same ad set uh, so when you do your test, you're usually going to do one or the other. You, this is an example, and you wouldn't do a old school test like this and a dynamic test all at the same time. You would choose one or the other. And you want to make sure that the audience is the same so that when you split test the ad, it's not going to be a different data or different people in those audience targets because then you're going to get different results. So you want to make sure it's the same audience and then different creative or it's the same creative and different audiences when you're running your tests. Now, were there any more questions before I go into how to make dark posts and scale them? Um, let's see. Uh, I don't think so for now. Um, oh, sorry, here. Do you suggest we're, uh, we're testing in the same geographic area or different locations? So when you set up your test, you're gonna have one ad set to start with and you're just going to target the same place. So for example, we're just targeting Los Angeles in this test. But if you have a wider net and you wanna target all of the US, uh, you can do that. Um, but essentially each test is gonna have its own ad set targeting and it's gonna be the same ad set targeting for all of the different tests that you have. Once you have your top ad, that's when you start going and testing the targeting. So remember how we had that triangle? I'm just gonna go back to it so you can visualize it. So we're testing this one here. Next step, once we get the dark post, is to start testing this step. So I hope that makes sense when you break it down and you're thinking about what variables need to be included. So first test, second test, third test. And then two more questions, Jack. Do you run your creative or copy test all at the same time or do you test each over a different period of time? And then last question is, um, what's better, dark post versus dynamic? So I'll answer the first one first. Um, so we run them all over the same time. So you wanna have the same, like you want as little variation apart from the copy and the creative as possible because you want all the ads to have the same opportunity to get clicks and conversions. You don't wanna favor one ad variation over the other. So when you create your campaign, so you can see here, this is a test campaign we have one ad set and this ad set's targeting is, so it's set to a daily budget. Actually, we're targeting the US, uh, we're targeting puzzle, jigsaw puzzles. Um, we're using a manual placement. We're just doing these types of placements. So we excluded messenger and stories just because our, our creative didn't match that placement type. Uh, we're doing one day click through and view. So all of the tests, uh, all of the ads have the same targeting. Nothing's changing with the targeting for each one of these tests. They all run for the same length of time. Um, they all stay on. Once you have a clear winner, so one that is severely ahead in terms of cost per purchase, ROAS, add to cart, add, cost per add to cart, click through rate, cost per click. Once there's a clear winner, you can then be like, okay, this is the best one. I'm gonna start scaling this one. Um, in terms of what I, we use, whether it's dark post or dynamic, this is that second question. We find that we, get, have, we have better success with dark posting if you're running like evergreen campaigns. So this is 
campaigns that run without an end date. So the reason we find this is because we keep pooling all of that social validation and it makes the ad better and better and better over time because we've been running ads in some accounts for six plus months and we have thousands of likes, shares, comments on those posts and with all of those comments creates a lot of conversation around the product, around the brand, around the community. It also acts as a Q&A sort of file. So there's a lot of extra value that you add to your ad without having to pay any more because people will go through and they'll read the comments and they'll see what people are saying about this product or brand. If you have no social validation, there's usually a much higher barrier to someone clicking through and wanting to find out what that brand is. So we definitely see that we get better results when we do dark posting. Um, if you're trying to do just like crazy high intense test testing and you're really looking at running super quick campaigns, like if you were doing maybe uh, something that you had to have new campaigns every week or something like that, uh, dynamic testing might be something better for you. But you know, all the accounts that we've scaled to $5,000 plus a day have usually been off the back of a handful of ads that have been dark posted. And those ads have been thoroughly tested and vetted. And that's why they're able to spend that amount of money and continually stay at a positive ROI or a positive ROAS. So it just really depends on the brand. But I would say if you're just a basic e-commerce store, uh, the dark posting method would be the best option. Um, so I'll show you guys how to create that dark post now. So what we want to do now is we've got this top ad and we want to keep all of this social validation. So we want to make sure that we get to carry all of this over to no matter what ad set or what campaign we create next because we've finished testing the creative and the copy and now we want to start testing the different targeting options. So here you can do a few things. So one, you can go take a look at your post because what we're going to do is we want to get the actual post URL because every single ad on Facebook is actually their own post. They're all unique and every single one of every single ad on Facebook has their own URL. Now, what you want to do is you want to get the uh, post ID, which is at the back here. It's that last uh, string of numbers. The other way that you can see posts is if you actually click on the date. So if you click on the date, it will also open up the post with the post ID. So you can see here ends in 213, 213. So you can get your post ID multiple ways. Um, so you want to make sure you grab the post ID and then you want to do a few things here. So first you want to change this. I always put the post ID actually in the title of the ad. And then what you're going to do is you're going to change your ad to an existing post. So once you change your ad to the existing post, it's going to populate. And this one, for example, 213 is already populated for me. But if it doesn't populate the right ad for you, because it will usually just take the last ad you've created, if you don't, you can click on add a post ID. You can submit your post ID and press submit. Okay, so that makes sure that anytime we duplicate this ad, we're telling Facebook to use this existing post ID. We do not want you to go and create a new ad with a new post ID and new URL. Because if we do that, we're going to lose all of our social validation. All right, so once you've got that, you're going to want to publish. While that publishes, any questions? Um, so what would, I mean, I don't know if it's really about Turk Post right now. Um, a few people are asking about um, what's an ideal audience size for a smaller brand. Yeah, so for audience size, you're usually going to want to do like the 2 million range. So, you know, the reason you want to have like, so you have two options. You either go super granular or you go super broad. But I really suggest that you do 2 million because what you want to do is you want to have enough people in there that you allow Facebook to optimize and find the best people in that audience and work with you on your ad cost. If you go super granular and you're like, okay, I know these 100,000 people are my perfect customer. Um, I'm going to really narrow my targeting down by gender, age, location, interest, all this stuff. You're going to find that your CPM is usually really high for those micro targeted laser audiences and you hit fatigue very quickly. So here, 
our CPM is $7.80. But usually when you go smaller and smaller and smaller and get much more refined with your audience, you're gonna find that this CPM starts to creep up. And the problem with that is that if you have a really high CPM, it means that you're paying a lot of money to show your ad to those people. So for example, we've seen CPMs up for, uh, to 20 or $30. So imagine paying an extra two to three times per click. So this is averaging 58 cents per click. So if you had a really expensive CPM, you would be paying say $1.58 instead or $1.60. So the issue with that is that your traffic becomes very expensive and now you have to have a much higher conversion rate on your website. So if you're monitoring that and you're saying like, okay, when I target this super small granular audience, our conversion rate is three times higher, then yep, go for it. Um, but usually it's very hard to sustain that because you hit frequency very quickly. Like this is a pretty big audience and we hit frequency after uh, of two after about uh, two weeks. If you have 100,000 people, chances are you're probably gonna hit that frequency cap probably within a week. So you're gonna have to go back and recreate a new campaign and create, uh, you know, uh, you could probably use the same ads, but you'd have to find new targeting. Now, the reason for that is because once you hit ad fatigue, you start seeing people hiding your ads or um, reporting your ads because you're starting to annoy them. Now, as soon as you start doing that, your quality scores start going down. And as soon as your quality scores start going down, your CPMs start getting more expensive again. So you get into this snowball effect of paying more and more and more to show your ad to the same people who are just angry because they've seen your ad six times and you usually have a really hard time scaling. So you can try the micro uh, targeting, but you have to be very on top of it. If you're just starting out and you're not that advanced, uh, you might wanna start looking at, yeah, two million size audiences because you've got enough audience size, you're not gonna hit fatigue too fast. You have enough audience size that Facebook can optimize and show ads to different people to keep your CPMs down um, because they are managing a massive auction that goes on behind the scenes. All of the advertisers are saying what they want, they're submitting their bids, and then Facebook is deciding who gets which impressions. And so usually when you have more flexibility in that, Facebook's gonna find more cost-effective impressions to give you. So I know that's very complicated and very advanced, but, um, but yeah, just think about that when you're looking at it. And I would say, yeah, two million is fine. Um, once you start getting a really, really good ad that's got a lot of social validation and converts really well, you can then start going in bigger and bigger and bigger audiences because you have much more data for Facebook to work with and go and find all those great customers in those bigger audiences. So when you start out, go to 2 million, as you start getting really good ads and as you start hitting kind of like 50 conversions a week, then start going to like four to 6 million and then you can keep going up from there. There's some ad accounts that we're spending $6,000 a day and we literally don't have any targeting parameters. We're like, okay, these are our top six ads. These are crazy good. They've got a ton of social validation on them. We are spending $6,000 a day. Facebook, go and find the best people. And we don't. We literally have no interest targeting on it. And because the ads are so good, they have so much social validation and the conversion rates are really good, um, usually Facebook can find the people using their data and algorithms that are going to convert. So think of that process. Um, it is harder starting out and then the bigger and better all your ads get and your data gets, the easier it gets to start um, targeting. So coming back to our ad here. So you can see this is the ad that we scaled. Um, the other thing is with my naming conventions, I usually call everything that's ad an ad and then everything that's dark posted, I'll say dark. Just so that when I'm scanning all of my ads, I can see which one have been dark posted and which ones haven't. Now, this is the, the secret here. So when we duplicate this, um, what we wanna do is, actually we can do two ways. We'll, we'll do it this way, it's easier. So now we've tested the ad, uh, ad copy and the creative. Now we wanna start testing the audience. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna duplicate this out three times. Okay, we're gonna duplicate these out. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna delete all the ones that aren't the dark posts. It's easy to do this once at a time, but it'll take a little bit longer. Um, 
So since we're doing this live, I'll just kind of delete everything. Sorry for all the construction going on outside. <laughs> all right, so now you can see we've got our top post in these three ad sets now. So now this is when we start changing up our targeting. So before we go and do that, um, let's talk about some of the different ways to find targeting options. So now that we've done the ad test, we want to think about, okay, how are we going to find new people to target? Because this is horizontally scaling. So we're not scaling the individual ad spend of our own ad set. We're actually scaling horizontally by choosing new ad sets with new targeting to try. So a few options in finding people to target that are really good are one, following people's page and looking at the suggestions. Two would be audience insights. And three would be using the Facebook ad suggestions. So when you go and like someone's page, you're gonna see this related pages option. Now go and copy all of those related pages and you can actually then start targeting those people because Facebook knows that a lot of people who like this page also like these pages. So that's a great way to find similar audiences and similar people. The next option is using the audience insights. We're gonna go and use this in a second. But what you can do here is you can actually look at every page, or not every page, but a lot of the indexed pages that Facebook has, and it will break down things like demographic, page likes, locations, activities. And this way, it will give you a, like a gold mine of data, which you can then go and use in your uh, ads, new ad sets to test different um, audiences. And the third way is within the ad accounts, you're gonna have a dropdown for suggestions. Now you've gotta be careful with the dropdown suggestions because you have to know what that interest is before you start targeting it because house and home are very broad. You have no idea what that is. These are probably like 300 million people in these groups. So definitely make sure that you know what that is and even do a little search for the actual page or interest on Facebook to see what shows up. But yeah, you definitely wanna be careful with which ones you select from the interest targeting. So I'm gonna show you a quick uh, walkthrough of the audience insights manager. So that one is by far my favorite. Um, audience insights, here we go. All right, and so if you ever wanna find someone's page, you can see that this is what you're gonna to wanna to search. I doubt this is gonna be indexed by a search, but we can use it because we're the admins. So if you wanna look at just the US, you can. For smaller interests, you might wanna actually look at the worldwide. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do like um, puzzles. Let's see what shows up for this. Puzzle games, entertainment, jigsaw puzzles. All right, so let's take a look at this. Worldwide, if we can, let's limit this to the United States if possible. Perfect, okay. So a few things here. So we can see the different ages that tend to like jigsaw puzzles, the genders. So this is telling me first up, I should probably just target women. Um, out of everybody who likes jigsaw puzzles, 78% of them are women. And you can see these gray areas, they are the average of all the users on Facebook. So you can see that this definitely trends to 45 to 65. So I might also think about testing that as a targeting option. Because remember, we're testing all the different targeting and traffic options here. So take, it, take note of these things. And you can also use, like this is probably another session <laughs> that we'll have to do, but you can do a lot of split testing uh, with Facebook. So you don't have to do it this way. You can do it actually in a controlled environment split test, but that'll probably be another session that we'll have to do. I'm just showing you how to get insights on who you might want to target. And then I'm going to take those, I'm going to create those new interests that we're going to, uh, those new ad sets, which we're going to test new interests and traffic with. You can see people are over the average of married. So you would definitely look at targeting married people, married females over 45. Um, and then there's a few other things. The tab that I really like is this one here. So you can take a look at page likes. So you can see by category what people like. And you can also see pages that have a high affinity. So these are things that we might wanna actually target. So this one, Arts and Crafts, I would say is a pretty good one. Um, I don't know who that is, but we could look him up. Brookbug, National Park Services, Dusty Old Things, I saw show up a few times, so let's copy that one. 
Uh, QVC, interesting, Shutterfly, Keurig. Um, let's do Pottery Barn. So we had three there. Okay, so you can obviously do spend a lot more time on this. You want to really go through your list and refine it and find find all the really good interest to target. But when we go back to our ad set here, so we have three. Now let's narrow this down with the targeting that we just had. So for example, we knew that it was 45. See, our test was actually terrible. We cut it off at 55. So we cut off a really good portion of our, uh, of our users. So I want to make this uh, 45 or 65 for everyone. I want to make this women. Um, so that's already 1.8 million. Um, so that's pretty, oh, actually, no, I've got to remove these. Sorry, my bad. I was thinking that's that's not many people that are married and female <laughs> over 45 on Facebook. Um, okay, so you can see we've got 52 million people here. Now, next, let's look at the detailed targeting. So let's look at Pottery Barn. We can do, you can see here 16 million people there. So we've got about 4 million. And we have a pretty good ad, so I'm willing to go with that for now. Um, we're using the manual placements. We'll use the same placements again. Uh, we'll do one day click. All right, so this is perfect. So we changed all of those just for ease of use. Now, what we're going to do is, so you can do this. You can do uh, 45, 65, 65. Uh, then we can do, do female. So female, pottery barn, 45, 65. All right, okay, so we're gonna leave that one, but now we're gonna actually change all of the interests for these other ones, because remember, we wanna, we wanna test to see which interests are doing really, really well. So now, instead of Pottery Barn, we're gonna try That's the Old Thing. So now there's only two million people in That's the Old Thing, 1.6. So let's open this up to all genders, and we're getting closer to two million, okay? So this way, we put that in there. Then let's take a look at the last one. Okay, let's take a look here and we do Jones. Fabric employees, Joanne, fabric and craft. So this one looks like the right one. You don't necessarily want to target the employees unless you're actually selling B2B. Um, but yeah, let's see how many people have this, 1.3. Let's also go to all. 1.5, okay, that's not too bad. Now the next thing we need to do, because this is prospecting, what we wanna do is we wanna exclude all of our remarketing audiences because we wanna know that we're just pulling in new customers using new people that we're going after. Your remarketing will be a separate campaign and you always wanna try and split up your prospecting and remarketing so you know the top and the bottom of the funnel. Remember, the bottom of the funnel is all of that remarketing. Top of the funnel is people who have no idea who you are. Um, so this gives us a much better over, overview of what's working, what's not, and what we should be target, uh, what we should be looking at at expanding for new customers. Because retaining old customers or remarketing is relatively easy. There's a lot of people who can do that, uh, a lot of apps that can do that, and that's not going to grow your business. Bringing in new customers is what's going to grow your business. All right. So the way that we exclude everybody who might have already heard about us is that we exclude people who engage with Instagram, people who engage with Facebook, uh, website visitors, 180 days, purchases, 180 days. All right, so this will pretty much cover everyone. If you have an email list, you might wanna also include that. Um, so you'd have to create your audience in Facebook and then go and create that in there as well. But that's gonna generally cover everything for us. And so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna publish this. We're gonna turn this one off because this is our test. So we want to see how these new ones do compared to the test. And this might take a little bit to publish. Great. All right, fantastic. Now, oh, I did not edit that one. This is why Facebook takes so long. <laughs> um, I need to update this one. And what I like to do is I like to do one interest per ad set so I can tell exactly what interest is converting really well. And then over time, we add all of the top interests into one ad set so that you have a bunch of 
really good audiences in one singular ad set. And that's the ad set you're gonna be running for six plus months. So once you have the best ads and the best targeting, that's the winning combination right there. And that's what you're gonna to wanna to use to keep scaling your ad spend by 10 to 20% every two to three days. Um, so you have a combination of horizontal and vertical scaling going on all at the same time. So essentially this is how we go about scaling accounts. Um, you use the best ads and then you go and do your research to find the best targeted audience. Now, we didn't go into using lookalike audiences and all that sort of stuff that you can imagine you can get very complex with all this. This is just basic interest targeting. You can get into multi-interest targeting. You can get into lookalike audience targeting. So there's a lot of different options when it comes to this um, that you wanna look at. You can take a look at some of our earlier training sessions where we go into creating really high intent audiences from your website data and turning that into uh, high intent lookalike audiences, which we use very effectively to scale um, past interest targeting. So when you start running out of interest targeting, you really need to start relying on your data to go and find your new customers because you might have gone through all of your best interests. And so the next best aren't going to probably convert as well. Now, you can never guess what's going to convert because usually what you guess is the complete opposite. So that's why you really need to test. But, uh, but you can imagine, you know, as you work further and further down those lists and as you run out of things to target, it gets easier and easier to start relying on lookalike audiences. Jim, were there any questions after going through all of that? I know that was a bit of a longer session. I can't hear you, by the way. Sorry, I keep confusing myself. Anyways, um, a lot of people are asking, why don't you just tar target puzzles? And the way I kind of go through that is puzzles is so big. It's so generic. It's like targeting dog, like someone who likes dogs, right? But if you go more into it, like targeting Pomeranians or Border Collie, you're going to get a better smaller audience to target and you're not wasting your money as much because it's a lot more in the funnel of just dog right so rather than just only, uh, saying puzzles you go more specific you know what type of affinity do they like and all that jack do you want to add anything to that yeah so puzzles would definitely be something you'd want to test i'm going mm -hmm. a little bit more granular in this example so you can kind of see a little bit more uh, of the process of finding interests but um but yeah, from puzzles, um, from jigsaw puzzles, puzzles wasn't even a high affinity audience here. So, uh, you know, some of these might actually convert better than puzzles, but either way, you can't guess this stuff and you would want to test it. So if you wanted to add puzzles into your test, you would duplicate this, change out the, uh, and change out the interest. So this is how you can do a lot faster testing once you've got your base foundation set up. So you can easily just duplicate that. You can come down here to your interest targeting. And what you can do is you can target puzzles. So if you have ideas, you can continually go. You can see that this is 115,000 people though. And now one little thing that you need to remember is that the reason it says unavailable here is because you have your uh, website targeting uh, exclusions here. So if you wanted to actually find out what that is, unfortunately, you have to delete these. It's super annoying um, what Facebook did. You can see this is 10 million. So I would probably target this um, with a few more restrictions. So we might also try women again, 7 million. And we might also narrow this down with married. Okay, 3 million. So we'll start with that. Um, and then as you start getting some good results and as your ad gets better and better, you can start expanding that audience more and more. So if you're just getting started out, you're not going to have high enough budgets to fully utilize the Facebook algorithms because you need what they say is 50 conversions a campaign um, a week. So you really want to look at how you're spending that money. Um, but yeah, let's definitely try this one here. So we have puzzles. And let's say married. Okay. Let's remove this. All right. So in that way, uh, I've got to do one more thing. I've got to add those back in. But yeah, as you get more and more, like, and as you start seeing results come through, this is like starting from the beginning. 
But as you start seeing your ad get more and more social validation, it starts converting better and better, you'll then start being able to make audiences without even having to check this. Um, because you know that you have really good ads that convert really well and you can keep going through and improving that. And the other thing is, you know, this is just one ad. We usually do this process over and over and over again to keep finding the best ads because you want to usually have three to six ads per ad set. But you want to make sure all of those ads are like top dark posted ads. Um, so this is also only one ad. So you might not want to test all of this straight away. You might want to test a few of them, get some good ROI from your investment on Facebook ads, then reinvest that into more testing of ads. Um, because the testing of ads is usually the expensive period. Like this site has done really well during this time period, but when you're testing, a lot of the time, it doesn't actually have a positive ROI because you're testing a bunch of stuff and a lot of the stuff that isn't gonna work is still gonna cost you money to collect that data. So a lot of the time when you do these uh, tests on new ads, you might lose a little bit of money to start with, but in the long run, once you've spent tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars on that ad, that small little test will have actually generated way more money than it would have been if you just tried to guess what was gonna work. Um, let me just add these in and then we'll go to more questions and I'll go over some final wrap up things that you can take a look at and we can do some live uh, reviews. So get those ready and start posting them and uh, I'll get to those in one sec. Um, Jen, was there anything else that uh, needed answering while I'm doing this? Yeah, so a couple of people are asking about um, one, audience overlap, and then if you're advertising to such a big audience, um, aren't you just wasting your money? unfortunately, right? Yeah, so audience overlap, that's why you wanna separate your, uh, your remarketing and your prospecting. So if you're worried about that, as soon as they engage with your ad or your website, they're no longer gonna be included in your prospecting campaigns. So you're gonna avoid that audience overlap. And the other thing is, once they move into that remarketing, or into those remarketing campaigns, then you can start filtering out based off like, uh, by different ad sets, people who engage with your Instagram, people who engage with your Facebook, people who engage with your website, your email service provider, all those different things. So you remember your goal is to push people from the top of the funnel to the bottom. So as they go through this prospecting campaign, they get pushed into the remarketing campaign and you will prevent that overlap there. Now, if you're worried about overlapping people who might be in both of these audiences, it's actually a great thing to target those people more because if they're in both of your best two audiences, chances are they're a great customer. So you don't wanna go and exclude like Dusty Old Thing from Pottery Barn and then Pottery Barn from Dusty Old Thing because then you exclude the person that's in both of those audiences who probably has the highest chance of converting. So don't worry too much about audience overlap. Um, worry about audience overlap with lookalike audiences. Um, so you can do a kind of like a, a data report in Facebook that will show the amount of overlap with your, uh, with your audiences. Interest targeting is not too bad. Um, it's really lookalike audiences that you need to worry about that overlap. So some of those uh, audiences that you create, for example, like you know add to cart lookalikes and initiate checkout lookalikes, they're very, very, very similar. So you might be running those two as separate ad sets and different targeting interests, but 90% of that audience might actually be the same person. So you might be better off just combining those two into one ad set. Um, so you've got to look at that as well. Um, all right, so let's jump back over and go over some final things. Um, so at the end of each section, I kind of swap up this and look at the key insights from this uh, session that you guys should focus on. Um, so when it comes to scaling, focus on your best ads, make sure you test those ads, and then focus on testing your uh, targeting. So go through that process. Um, validation, social validation is super important. Um, we find that ads definitely convert at a much higher rate and have much higher ROAS when they have a lot more comments, engagement, and shares. Another thing with social validation, uh, social shares are like a gold mine. An ad, uh, if you watched our previous training sessions, it shows you how to narrow in on or narrow down to your best possible ads. Your best possible ads are the ones with really high share ratios and really high ROAS because every time someone shares that ad, you're getting all of those earned impressions. So earned impressions are 
say Jen sees my ad, she shares my ad with her friends and family and coworkers, and then she, I didn't have to pay to show my ad to any of those people. So that's an earned impression for me. And that if one of those people convert, then that decreases, that improves my ROAS and decreases my cost per acquisition because I didn't even pay for that. Um, so earned impressions are really important. Social validation helps with that. Uh, use your data. So continually test, make sure that you're testing to find the best ad and testing to find the best audience and then scaling that. Make sure you're scaling horizontally and vertically. Vertically, remember, is 10 to 20%. They say daily, but I suggest every two to three days. Um, you don't want to go into learning stage. It's uh, such a pain. Um, and creative. Focus on creative first and then start testing copy. Now, a few takeaways we have uh, for your to-do list. Um, remember, we can send you these slides if you want, if you need a reminder, or you can screenshot this. Um, start using audience insights. Very powerful tool. Really going to help you find better interest targeting. Um, if you're struggling to write your copy, now we didn't go talk too much about writing copy, but if you're struggling to write copy, one exercise I really like to do is I do a list of all of the product features and then I write out a benefit for each one of those features. And that's gonna help you understand what the actual benefit of your product is, not just the feature, because you wanna write your ads around benefits. I can see you wanting to add something there, Jen. <laughs> I can't hear you. Sorry, I just never know when to jump in. Um, also... No, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, can I can hear you sound now. Sound cut? Oh, okay, sorry guys. Um, one other thing I like to do is have um, the customers write the, the copy for you. So I said this in every single um, uh, webinar we have because the customers are using your product. You're selling your product, but they're using it. So let them write it for you. You have testimonials, like that's gold for you, right? So if they're saying that how they like to use it, use that as a copy and then just a simple shop now, visit a store. So um, if you're struggling to write copy, use the testimonials from your customers. Thank you. Nice. Um, yeah, great addition there and Another few things, start testing your ads. Um, stop trying to guess what's gonna work. Test just two to three variations, that's all it takes. Vertically scaling, we talked about. Start using dark posts, start leveraging that social validation. Um, focus on your funnel, so split up your account into prospecting and remarketing. You can get much more granular and do top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel if you want, but just start with top and bottom, that's the easiest way to get started. Uh, double down on remarketing. So once someone does go from prospecting to remarketing, make sure you're remarketing that person enough. It takes six to eight touch points uh, to usually have uh, build enough confidence in someone to make a purchase. So remarketing is really important. If you don't do remarketing, that person only sees you once or twice and the chances of them buying after one or two uh, in interactions with your brand is probably quite small. And then focus on the share. Um, so that's a quick to-do list for you guys. So let's go through and do some live reviews. Um, so definitely chuck your uh, post ID or post uh, URL, your ad post URL, which I showed you how to get. Put that in the comments. I will go through them now. Let me pull up those. And, and Jack, while we're, we're pulling up some stuff, a few people had a couple questions on um, if you're duplicating an ad set, can you increase the ad set budget on the new ad set or will that mess up the learning phase? Wait, sorry, what was that? I was looking at the chat, sorry. <laughs> Fine. Um, can you give guidance on adding, oh, sorry. When duplicating ad sets, is it okay to increase the ad set budget on the new ad set or will that mess up everything with your learning phase and optimizations? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I would definitely have to look into that exactly. Usually when I duplicate something, that's my opportunity to like double or triple it. But usually by that point, we're getting out of learning phase pretty quickly. Um, so on a smaller budget, I'm not sure, but uh, usually you will have to go through that learning phase anytime you start a new ad set. Um, so as soon as you duplicate it, you're going to go through the learning phase anyway, so you might as well increase your budget on it. But you can't expect to get the same results from an optimized campaign out of learning stage as a new campaign in learning stage at a higher budget. Um, the other thing to note is if you're targeting the same audience, 
it will re start retesting that entire audience. So you'll be showing your ads to each uh, the same people again. And, you know, that might be a good thing, but it also, the ad set has its own individual metrics. So the frequency of each ad set do not match up. So each ad set will have its own frequency. So if you're in a two frequency in one ad set, targeting the same audience as another ad set that has only a four frequency, you might actually be on a six to eight frequency for a, a few people in that group. So just keep that in mind, we're duplicating our ad sets with the exact same targeting. And one last question before we go on, I'm so sorry. Um, do you use UTMs and how granular do you get? Yep, definitely use UTMs, very, very important. Um, now, when it comes to UTMs, I'll show you exactly how we create these. So let's do it for all of these. All right, so down the bottom, you have UTMs here. Building your own is the easiest. I introduced this uh, maybe about a year ago, and it has taken millions of years of my life. Um, I do campaign name, and I do ad set name. So usually I do this, so one, I can see the source, uh, I can see the uh, that I'm paying for this traffic, and then I can see the campaign name and the ad set name. Now, you can get even further and keep adding parameters and do the ad name. Um, but I usually just stop at campaign and ad set. Um, but you can definitely get, like if you're doing, you know, five to $10,000 a day and you're getting super granular with your data, you can definitely add in the ad name as well. Um, so you can keep filtering that through. You just need to add another parameter. But that's usually what we use. Um, it keeps it pretty consistent and it makes sure that it changes and maintains uh, if anything, uh, it ma makes sure that it keeps the UTMs up to date if anything changes in the actual ad name or ad structure. Ideally, you want to have one naming convention structure and then just go with that the whole time so everything's consistent. Um, but I know that's very hard to do. Um, but yeah, the more consistency you can have with media buying, the easier it will be and the better results you'll usually get. Um, so yeah, just remember to do that and remember to turn off your test just to get this one started because we're using CBO on this. So it's a daily budget and we're saying, Facebook, spend this as effectively as possible. And if this one's already spent 300 uh, plus dollars at a four row as Facebook's just gonna keep spending on this. But you wanna give these guys a chance to actually start spending. Now, if you wanted to, you can have, I would usually suggest you have a new campaign. So you do a campaign for the test and you have a new campaign for the actual ongoing stuff but just for the speed of use here, we just put it all into one campaign. All right, great. So let's go through a few of these. Um, should I start from the top or do I start from the bottom, Jen? Um, start from the bottom or like within the middle because a lot of people put in a couple. Um, okay. There's a couple in there if you just want to use. There's kind of like questions and Scattered through. Maybe so, previous training. Um, Maybe use the second one down from Joseph oh. Taylor. Wait, right, hold on. All right, so I've got this one here. Okay. Um, there's a lot of landing pages in here. Um, and did you want to go and review this one and I'll line up a few? You that we can do? Sure. Um, are we just going to do this or are we going to look through their ads library as well? Um, well, this was just a submitted landing page. So let's maybe just review the landing page. Um, right. and then And then we can talk about the, uh, the ads library afterwards. I just want to make sure we get through a few people because last time we did this, we didn't get through too many people. You got it. Um, so first thoughts already, it's it's a box that has a ribbon on it. We don't know what's in this box. Um, there's no CTA um, above the fold and there's no um, really a big description on it. So I would actually move that bindle box on the side, either on the right or the left, and then add like, surprise, uh, I'm, not, I'm not even 100% sure what it is. So add a small description of why someone would buy it um, right on that side. So it looks like, like gift sets, right? So we see where it says exquisitely presented hand-wrapped Australian design gifting. I would actually add that next to the box itself. So that way someone, when they're coming to the site, they automatically know what it is. Jack, do you have anything else? 
So I'm going on your lead. Um, yeah, the other thing is, um, you yeah, know, this is actually a pretty good looking site. The only, the only thing here is I would definitely add way more information above the fold. Uh, most people don't go below the fold. You'll look at your, if you're doing heat maps, like something on Crazy Egg, or you can even use Google Analytics, you find that, you know, 60% of people don't even scroll past that. Um, so make sure that you have your value proposition up the top here. Make sure you have a call to action here. So I would probably move this over, tell them exactly what your product is and the benefit of it, and then have a call to action to make a purchase. So you better utilize that top of the funnel, uh, the top of the page. As you go down here, this is really good. This looks super professional. Uh, pricing is here. What I would probably do, I would add um, a buy button. On mobile phone, you can't see the difference of the cursor and you're not gonna get this animation. So it's still a good idea to use buttons because on mobile, you're not gonna be able to even know that this is actually clickable. So I would add some buttons under there. Um, Bindle Moon, okay. Now, for anybody who doesn't have this, I really highly encourage people use their validation in PR or anywhere they've been featured, any celebrities or anybody important who has used their product, um, anywhere that you've uh, been featured or included, uh, anywhere you've written content for, or anybody who you've written content for or created content for. Um, it's a good idea to bring in other people's uh, brands to increase your credibility. The other thing is adding customer testimonials, that sort of thing can help uh, to also increase your credibility. Um, oh. As far as the photography, this is great. Um, and you've got one down here. I would add another call to action at the bottom of the page. So once people get there, they have somewhere to go. I love that this is from Melbourne. <laughs> yeah, welcome home. Oh, this is a good one. Also, Jack, I added the Wait, no, I added the um, other one to also do to check through. You want to check that too. Where did you send that to me? In the chat or on Slack as well. Oh, I've got my Slack closed. It's too annoying when I'm doing this. Okay. <laughs> I'll open it. Uh, Hold on. Go um, in the chat and put my name and I added at Jack. All right. So you can see on this one here. Yeah, I'll open up now. You can see on this one here, you have the buy button here. You have a slideshow, which is showing multiple products, um, which is good. You could even maybe... Um, I don't know, make this centered. I, that's fine. Over in the I corner, that's fine. Like that. um, add another call to action here. Um, one of a kind, handcrafted. Um, I would also use dot points. So have a little intro, then use some dot points about why your brand is different. So is it sustainable? Is it you know ergonomic? What is the benefit to it? Is the materials something special about the material? Something special about how you use it? Um, you can add that in. This is great because you can easily see the products. Again, add that buy button because you won't see it on mobile. Um, here, you can, you don't necessarily need to add descriptions. Um, I wouldn't probably bother putting this here. You're better off putting a GIF and then having a play button if you're going to play a video. Um, it's going to speed up your page load a lot. Um, bringing in this is fine. Um, just what if you do have a slow page load though? A lot of the time, it's bringing in the uh, the what you call it the uh, Instagram feed that takes a long time. So limit the amount of what people that uh, limit the amount of images you're bringing in, or just manually add images down the bottom. Um, okay, so let's try this next one. You know the kitchenette bucket one, Jack. Uh, yeah. Hold on. Got so many links here right now. <laughs> Um, well, you just wanna... get to them. Okay, this one here. I'll send it again. No, I got it, I got it, I got it. All right, there you go. Do you want to go through this one, Jen? Yeah, 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 sure. So, um, I mean, you're going to have to kind of go through with me. Um, no, it's a great call to action in the front. I'd actually put the enter store right at the center at the bottom. Um, so it doesn't feel a little floaty or weird. Um, and it's put onto the bottom so it feels better. The white text actually blends in with her shirt, with her spatula thing. And the little copy on the bottom does kind of blend in. It's a little faint. But th this is actually a pretty good example of how you're adding the product and um, the benefit onto the banner and the homepage. So that's really important. So we know what it is. We see what it is. And it's telling you what it what it is, right? So trusted kitchenware and incredible deals. Um, scroll down a little. 
store bundles and featured offers. Um, my one concern is the, the images are a little um, not the same size and there's a lot of text right underneath, like a lot of text describing it. Um, I would even put it as bundles and uh, bestsellers so it kind of sounds better. And if Jackie want to scroll down, I think this would be better on image base versus like having all the the copy. Um, the shipping is great. Um, kitchen helper, mm, that looks great. I would see if there's a way to make that picture bigger. Um, shop cutting words. So now, now you're getting to a point on the homepage where there's too much. Um, I would actually just cut, put the customer reviews and all the other rest of the shopping to leave it into like the shop tab. Awesome. What is this, John? Yeah, a few quick things I would also add to that is change the color of this, make it bigger. Um, this you might want to put three and three, or maybe just three across and make these bigger, or make this width bigger. So you can see you're only using like 60% of the page here. Um, having said that, my page, my screen is a massive monitor, so it's not actually this wide. But yeah, you might want to have bigger images because there's a lot going on in the images. Um, two to five days shipping. You don't necessarily need to put this here. It's best to put your shipping details in a hello bar. So a little thing that goes across the top that says like uh, how fast your shipping is and then the amount of money you have to spend to get free shipping. Um, this is fine and some more chopping boards. See, this looks a lot better because you have the same size image. Um, you have the same size images, so it looks a lot cleaner. That looks um, a lot better than the one above it. Yeah, and I would also move the customer reviews up when you guys are choosing what image, uh, what images and products to add to your homepage, look at your best converting products and look at the ones that you have the best uh, profit margins on. So mm -hmm. that will help you choose which items to add to your homepage if you have a lot of products uh, in yep. your store. And I would also just add, um, I think the order is always like, you know, the CTA and like what you are at the top. And right underneath, I would either put testimonials and features. So if you're featured in somewhere big, um, the testimonials and all that, and then like bestsellers underneath that. So just so it kind of has, you know, oh, a lot of people do come here and shop. A lot of people do like the product. So when you're kind of looking through it, you have like a good, you know, order of things. Go ahead, John. Okay, great. We'll do this one. Um, okay, so first off, this is the homepage. I would definitely add like a banner here that goes over kind of what you do, uh, why you're different, that sort of thing. Um, it's a little bit hard to get a feel for the brand if it's just kind of like this category page straight up on the homepage. Um, also adding in those other things we mentioned, ability through testimonials, features, all that sort of stuff. Um, if you can call out any benefits to your product, like how they made, how they sourced, what's the materials, is there a story behind the company and how you created it and why you created it. Um, if you add a little bit of uh, context to your product and a little bit of information, it does keep people a little bit more interested just because you do have, um, my mouse is going crazy, just because you do have a little bit more to talk about and you give people a story behind the purchase. So, you know, companies like Tom's and all that sort of stuff, you can see an example of someone who has done really well at creating a story around their brand. Um, we can do this next one. So here, destination scented candles. This is great because you could have just said destinations, which I see a lot of brands doing. They just call out their name, but they don't have any subtext to say what they're actually selling. Because destinations can be used, uh, you'd be surprised at how often you see this, but destinations could be used as anything. It could be travel related. Um, it could be any product or niche really, but because you've added scented candles there, you get it straight away what it is. Um, yeah, and well, that's a good example too of a hello bar just in case anyone was wondering what a hello bar is they have a great hello bar up there yeah um again i would make this a gif it looks like it probably already is but you can make this a short gif and i would make it more about the products just going through your products rather than trying to put these lifestyle shots in here just have a you know a kind of set up background that's not too con like not too complicated or anything there's not too much going on in the background because you want your focus to be on the product uh, okay, welcome to Snapchat Center Candles. This is great. Bacteria hand gel, nice. Um, I wouldn't bother putting animations in some of this stuff. Um, this is actually not too bad though. I like this. Uh, um, but yeah, definitely choose images that are all the same size and ratios so that you don't have too many like switching up. Um, 
But yeah, you could probably make this into like a, a GIF reel or something. See, this is actually what I'd rather see instead of this. And I would rather see this stuff in kind of like a dot point form, just in a section where there's like an image or a GIF on the left and then dot point form on the right of all the benefits and features about your product. And then I want to get to this stuff to see what it actually is and if I'd be interested in any of it. Um, testimonials are great. Um, this is great. Our candles are inspired. Fantastic. Okay, we did private labeling. So private labeling, I would definitely put this in your footer or something like that. 99% um, of the traffic coming to your website is not going to be looking for private labeling. So you don't necessarily want to make it about private labeling. You want to definitely have that down in a, a section in your footer or something. Make the homepage all about the individual shopper and your core audience. So think about who your main customer is. Where, where are you making 80% of your revenue? Tailor your homepage to that 80, uh, sorry, that 80% of revenue. Because usually it's 20% of visitors, or not even, it's way less actually. But usually it's an 80-20 rule. You want to focus on the best products and the best customer type and put your homepage built around that. Um, all right, so let's go through a few more. Um, can you do a couple ads, Jack, a few people want to do ads. So Tony up there has ads to look through, and I feel like because we were talking about ads earlier, it might be helpful to look through some ads too. Yeah, let me go through this. Jen, do you want to do this one, and I will uh, find some ads? Cool. Um, so with the face masks, that one's actually pretty uh, – I don't know 100% if it's just face masks, but that was the one that came up. The text is really small. It blends in with everything. Like right now you have white on white on white. So it's really hard to read. Um, same with the CTA button. Um, you want it, that's a good location for it, but you want the text to be bigger. I'm not 100% sure what, uh, what exactly this is. I saw bread, I saw masks, I saw, I think, chair. So this household. So I would definitely have that at the top to make sure that we know what you guys are selling. So if people are coming to this site for the first time, you guys know your product, you guys know your site, but it doesn't help as a new person, as a prospecting person, we want to see what it is. So it's nice to have this philosophy on there, but I still don't know what exactly this company does. So at the top, definitely, like the destination thing, uh, company, destination, and sent a candle on the bottom was really helpful. Um, one other thing with these, I'm saying like inconsistent uh, backgrounds. So if you're going to have stock photos or like product photos, make sure the backgrounds are consistent because it just makes it really off-putting in the eye. But I like that you have bestsellers. Make that bold. Make that people like see like it's in people's faces. And if you can, um, adding like little stars to see if people reviewed it underneath the product is really great. Cool. All right. So let's do okay so we've got an ad here we're going to quickly review so anytime you're doing fashion or anything carousels do really well because you're really looking for um you're really looking for something that's going to be a browse experience another thing that works really well with uh, apparel is collection ads so that's why when you expand it it shows all the products in your collections um, the other thing is definitely building that social validation is going to help people, um, you know, trust this brand more. Okay, so these sum essentials are almost sold out. Okay, 20% off. Can't click that. So so that's good good I would actually switch it so it says use code, you know, 20% off, and then these are sold out. Hurry. Like, give them a call to action of why they should come. Like, shop now before they sell out. Yeah, the other thing I would also do is I would create collections with themes. If you have products that are uh, regularly bought together or if you have outfits that have different pieces to it or if you have like all dresses, you have all jumpsuits, you have all pants or all shoes, try and maybe make, if you're creating a collection, try and maybe make those collections so that when people are looking through, they have the option to just look at those collections. And then also split test that with just random stuff that's just your top sellers. So these might be your top sellers, I'm not sure. But yeah, definitely choose either collections or top sellers and go about it that way uh, with collections. Um, this is another one, indoor, outdoor, 1080, no subscription, local storage, live view, we got you covered. All right, so you definitely need to say a little bit more about what your brand does or what it is. Um, 
easy viz i assume it's like video editing or something the other thing is your holding screen is really important so the thing here is um you have this option to use this to capture someone's attention because if someone has data saving on when they're on their mobile phone it's not going to auto play it's just going to stop here and this is going to blend into the news feed so you want to have something that's like super bright colors it's like a really awkward moment of the video or it's something crazy that's about to happen. You can get a lot of great ideas from YouTubers. YouTubers are really good at creating suspense through a, a thumbnail on a video and creating that click to, to go and click and play that video. So check out some really good YouTubers for some ideas. I would definitely change this thumbnail to make it more clickable and intriguing. Um, the video we can go through, um, just another idea. Okay, so it was actually security lights. Um, so yeah, I would just, uh, put a main call to action line here. So it might be like, you know, super easy home security installation in 30 minutes. Um, or you can even shorten that more, just make it like, you know, five to five to 10 words that summarize what you are and why, why you're the best at what you do if possible. And also, and also this is a safety thing. So call out that insecurity feeling unsafe. You need these lights. These are the ones that are like, these lights have made me feel safe at home. So call out the, the pain points of why people are or would buy these products. So um, showing that it's indoor, outdoor, great, but we don't know it's a security thing. So aim on their vulnerabilities, aim on their safety, you know, hit that will hit home. Okay, great. So if anybody has any follow-up questions or anything, um, they want us to review any ads or anything else, um, we can definitely go through some of those at a later date. We sort of dragged this on and it's coming up into, uh, <laughs> I think, a 90-minute uh, webinar, which is very long. Uh, so yeah, definitely follow up if you have any questions or if you have any, um, if you want us to review anything. You can find us at jack at topgrowthmarketing.com. You can find Jen at jen at topgrowthmarketing.com. Uh, you can email us. We'll send you the slides. Um, we'll send you feedback. Uh, jen had a bunch of assets that we send out as well uh, that will help you with your media buying. There's like cheat sheets and templates and that sort of stuff. Uh, also, make sure you screenshot these and uh, or email us, and we'd be more than happy to send them to you. Um, and then, yeah, you can check out more at topgrowthmarketing.com or jackpaxson.com, either one. Uh, but yeah, more than happy to help out. And uh, Hans, you've been awesome. Thank you so much for having us. And uh, I'm sure we'll probably do more and we'll go into more split testing and more in-depth stuff later on. But uh, thanks, guys. Enjoy the weekend and uh, have a good one. Thank you.